And it's my great pleasure first to introduce Isabel Hunter from Libraries Connected. And uh, her paper is Libraries in Lockdown. And the paper draws on research by Libraries Connected and Carnegie UK Trust to explore how public libraries responded to the pandemic, how they will contribute to post-pandemic recovery and what that means for their services in the future. So over to you, Isabel. Right, thank you very much, Guy, and uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for attending the, um, the session. It's great to be here at BCDC. Um, so first, a couple of words about Libraries Connected, for those of you who don't know us. We're the membership body for public libraries in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the Crown Dependencies. Uh, we're also funded by Arts Council, so we're the sector support organisation for public libraries. And public libraries are a really vast sector. There's um, about 3,500 library branches, 15,000 staff, and in 2019, there were 26 million library visits and 171 million books borrowed. So it's a service that reaches across all communities and deep into people's lives. Um, and in 2019, 34% of the population visited a library. And before I kick off with the paper, I just want to say an enormous thank you to those of you working in libraries, if that's a university library, school, or an academic library. You know, it's been the most challenging, most difficult, difficult year, but libraries have remained really focused on serving their users and their communities. And for me, it's been really humbling to see the dedication and the innovation and the determination of staff really keen to keep their services running, whatever the challenge is. I think it's also really shown that it's the people, it's the library staff who are the lifeblood of the service. Yes, libraries are all about the space and the resources and the books and so on. But so many of the comments I've read from users um, has been about how they've appreciated the thoughtful approach of the staff, the very personalised services they provide. And I think that's absolutely shone through this year. So I think it's a really good point at the moment. We're, we're hopefully coming out of restrictions um, or, or moving further away from them in the next few weeks. It's a really good point, I think, to reflect on how far we've come since March 2020, that terrible day when library doors had to close and staff were sent home. But in public libraries now, we've got tried and tested ways of generating digital engagement. We can run COVID secure services and we're delivering new things, new services like Kick and Collect. It's been a period where we've really proved the flexibility of library staff. So in the first lockdown, about 25% of public library staff were redeployed to other emergency roles in councils, everything from um, uh, delivering parcels, um, running community helplines, even working in, in crematoria. And it was their skills in organisation, working with people and knowing their community. Those skills that they honed in the library were so eagerly sought out in redeployment and, and in the terrible emergency um, that, they, that they faced. And what libraries delivered in that first lockdown was staggering. And that's been um, revealed by research, both by Libraries Connected and also the Carnegie UK Trust. So staff had to be sent home, the doors had to be locked to the public. But what followed was an incredible surge of creativity driven by that determination of the staff um, wanting to keep the services going. So many libraries delivered keep in touch calls. So th this was about really keeping that, what like public libraries often call the libraryness going. Um, so we think over 130,000 keep in touch calls were delivered where staff phoned older or, or shielding or vulnerable residents. So the calls often provided practical help, like linking that person with a service to get their shopping or get their medicine delivered. Um, but in, some, in every case, it was about easing isolation. One lady said she broke down in tears after the library phone call. She'd felt so relieved she hadn't been abandoned and somebody had remembered her. Another chap had been living with his elderly mother for many years, but she'd just died. And the library phone call was the first time he'd had First chance he's had to talk to anyone about the bereavement and the terrible impact it had on him. Suffolk Library Service alone made 7,000 calls in the first three months of lockdown. They found out from one elderly resident that she had a favourite book that she wasn't able to read anymore because she'd lost her sight. So the library staff took turns to read her a chapter over the phone. So it was, you know, really example of the keeping touch calls and, and going the extra mile and, and doing that as that very, very personalised service. Libraries uh, and all libraries really put their backs into developing their digital offer. 
So public libraries have, have had a, a really good offering of e-books, e-audio, magazines and newspapers. But in lockdown, they really, really pushed that and developed that. So the libraries changed their membership procedures so people could sign up online quickly and easily. And we saw sign up rates surging by 600 percent, including lots of people who were new to the hadn't previously been library members. E-lending has effectively doubled over the lockdown um, and the signs that it's going to stay. It, it will dip as uh, lockdown totally eases, but there are signs that it will stay at a much higher level than previously. And there's also been notable growth in things like children's books. Parents had previously been quite reluctant to encourage their kids to have even more screen time. But in lockdown, they were desperate for titles to educate the children and, and to keep them entertained. What was interesting as well is that libraries looked at, at moving their regular events and activities online. So they started with things that were a bit simpler to do um, and, and sort of a one way performance, um, things like story times and rhyme times. And then as they gained confidence and also as the audience, audiences um, developed confidence with online um, attendance events, the events came a bit more sophisticated and increasingly interactive. So things such as online author tours, job clubs, craft sessions, walking groups, knit and natter sessions, befriending sessions, they, they started to appear too. Some online events have regularly achieved audiences of, of, of a thousand people. Um, and some in the early days, especially, reached over 20,000, which was staggering. But again, it was just that appetite. Families wanted structure in their day and found the um, attending a, a library rhyme time um, was a sort of positive point in the day. It also supported their baby's language development. And adults were keen to attend these events because they eased the tedium and loneliness of lockdown and shielding. Online events have reached new people who hadn't used the library before and also kept existing users connected in new ways. For some residents, they were the hook to encourage them to use Zoom or FaceTime with support from library staff to help them understand how to work their laptop and, and how to use Zoom. Libraries also looked at innovations in how they could get books into people's hands. So after the first lockdown was lifted, libraries rushed to deliver order and collect services now, these took varied forms, and that was partly determined by the availability of book stuff, stock. There was, you know, lo loads and loads of stuff was still out on loan. Libraries had, had given people extended loan periods so that books were still, you know, in people's houses and hadn't been returned. They were also in locked libraries because not all branches had been able to open. So some libraries offered a service where readers could choose and reserve what they liked from the catalogue, but others um, offered um, what they called a ready-read service where they had packs of pre-selected books chosen by theme or age brackets and there were some libraries that offered um, a sort of a personal shopper version so they looked at what the reader's borrowing record was understood what they like and then they chose things from the available stock so it's you know it's really interesting actually because ready read and the personal shopper thing were things that were developed because book stock was limited but they actually proved a really surprising hit Parents said their children got really excited to open up the packs of books at home. It was a bit like Christmas looking at what was in there. And they enjoyed being introduced to all sorts of new books they wouldn't have tried before. I think some adults found it a bit like um, one of those food services like Hello Fresh, where um, it all comes nicely packed and you're introduced to a whole load of new flavours you wouldn't have tried. And library staff also said it was a really good experience for them. They had to really think about selection and reader preferences. So it's a fresh chance to use that, those library skills to step into readers' shoes. So it's a service that many libraries would love to continue for the long term, resources permitting. Libraries also did some really surprising things that were outside their usual remit, things you wouldn't expect them to do. And a lovely example was at Gateshead Library, where they've got a maker space with 3D printers and laser cutters. So they turned these on and started creating visors and PPE equipment in, in that, that period when local care homes and GPs just couldn't get hold of supplies and that, you know, that terrible early stage of lockdown. When the, van, the library van arrived at one care home, the staff had lined the car park to applaud it and some of them were in tears. They were so desperate and so thankful for the supplies that the library was able to provide. So it really is incredible to look back at March 2020 and to think how much libraries have innovated, um, you know, uh, overnight, really, and, and, and now doing things that seemed unimaginable or impossible. Those things are now routine. What was also significant was that the government, government recognised two things about public libraries. 
Firstly, that libraries provide a complex mix of services. Sometimes I describe public libraries a bit like a Swiss army pen knife rather than a single tool. There's you know, all sorts of things inside a small package. The second thing the government recognized was that libraries are essential to their communities. And this was enshrined in lockdown regulations. So libraries were granted really quite significant exemptions to run some of the services, even in a um, complete lockdown. Um, so they were able to provide PC access, home library service, order and collect, and a number of other things. And library staff were also formally recognised as essential workers. And this recognition by central government of how essential libraries were, that was massively powerful at the local level and, and uh, within the councils that, uh, where libraries belong. So now that we're hopefully, hopefully finally emerging from this pandemic, I think we really need to keep hold of that belief in the flexibility and innovation of libraries and their staff and the confidence that comes from it. We've dealt with everything the pandemic has thrown at us. We can really face the future with determination. So I'm just going to quickly look at a couple of things um, about the next 12 months and beyond and look at what are the priorities for library works and what channels will they need to deliver that work through. So as we've seen, public libraries have really proved their worth to their communities. So they're now well placed to play a vital role in recovery. And we all know that recovery is going to be a really extended process. We're not going to bounce back overnight. So last autumn, Libraries Connected published an advocacy report called Libraries, an Essential Part of Recovery. And this set out the key priority areas that will face local authorities and communities in pandemic recovery and highlighted the contributions that libraries can make to these. So we published that report back in September. But since then, these factors have been thrown into even sharper relief. You know, every week there is more reports and evidence coming out about how serious these issues are. So the priorities we identified are economic recovery and supporting people back into work. So businesses have been shattered. Unemployment has surged and will probably surge even further once furlough completely ends. But libraries have got a strong track record in providing advice and support to new businesses and to help people seeking work. Second priority is educational support and closing the disadvantage gap. So libraries have a vital role um, in providing access to resources and activities and study space. They can play a strong role in helping close the yawning gap that's emerged. So we're looking forward to the summer reading challenge and that's gonna be especially important this year. That's gonna be a way of using that six week holiday to keep children reading and to help them to catch up with what they've missed. The third priority is around isolation mitigation. And so many people's mental health has taken a real battering after months of isolation and limited social contact. But libraries can bring people back together through events, provide a friendly space for them to visit and use targeted support such as books on prescription, reading friend schemes and bereavement groups. Another priority is digital inclusion, with some reports stating that about 20% of the population is digitally excluded. They lack the skills, they lack device, they lack data and connectivity. So the people's network that's in every library, the internet, computers and Wi-Fi will have a massive role to play. That normally provides over 26 million hours of internet access a year. But there are also new schemes that libraries are developing to get devices and connectivity into people's homes and to help them develop the skills and confidence they need. And we're also uh, working with JISC on looking at can we roll Eduroam out into public libraries to support students and um, academic staff when they're off campus. And the final priority is support for the local cultural sector. So libraries will be really key local venues. They're safe, they're accessible. Um, so they can provide access to uh, smaller scale performances and exhibitions at a time when larger venues may still not be able to open and some, audience, some people may not feel safe to visit them. So libraries already deliver against all of these priorities and have got tried and tested approaches. But what may be different for libraries in the year ahead is the choices on which services to prioritise. Obviously, the balance of need in every community will be different, but it also, for some libraries, may mean a really hard choice between delivering a, the traditional universal service that a library provides or a more targeted one. So the second thing I want to look at is how will libraries deliver? What shape will their services be? And I think the experience of the pandemic has shown that you know, libraries have been 
robust and resilient because they've delivered through different channels and been able to ramp those up or down as lockdowns come and gone. So it's really clear um, that for the challenges ahead, we need to continue to deliver what we're calling the three channel library service with deliver th delivery through three channels. So on site and physical, it's really important we get our buildings open, we get people to come back in um, to, to come together again to access face to face service and all the physical resources that libraries provide. The second channel is digital. So we need to continue to expand our digital offer. We need to keep hold of the new digital users who've come to libraries, but also to expand libraries' digital assistance to help real bridge that terrible digital divide. And the final channel is outside the walls. So again, we can build on the proven success of home library service, which was a vital lifeline for so many during the lo lockdown. Um, we can also continue to, to grow more partnerships. So again, there was really successful work with charities and food banks during the pandemic that got library services out to those who need it. And we can also experiment with bringing libraries into locations deep into communities. So again, none of this is new. Libraries have been operating across those three fronts for a long time. But again, it's the balance between these three will need to change. And then also the need for some specific investment or development in them. So in terms of immediate priorities over the next 12 months, there are some very clear things facing libraries. So firstly, get the physical libraries open again to support job seekers, to support students, to put, support vulnerable people and local businesses and encourage people back over the threshold to feel safe and to enjoy themselves and to feel at home again in their library. We need to restore events and activities. So at the moment, there's a particular focus on um, getting events back for early years and that pressing need to support babies and young children's speech and language development. We need to develop the digital offer. So there's a lot of work to do to work with publishers to improve the availability of e-licenses so that libraries can develop a much richer selection of, of online books. We need to develop the existing people's network and um, develop more digital inclusion pro programs that get outside libraries and get devices into people's hands. And finally, outside the walls, I think there's going to be some really interesting work happening this year with outdoor events, things like story walks in parks and gazebos for events and activities, and all of this driven by new partnerships to really reach deep into communities. So the last 15 months has been you know, absolutely terrible in so many ways. But it's also been a year when public libraries have proved their worth again and again. And library staff have been allowed to innovate and take the lead in developing services because they're the ones who know their users, they interact with them every day. So as we move out of the pandemic, the year ahead may be equally daunting, but I hope it can be a period when staff can continue to feel they're the lifeblood of the service and that they're encouraged to grow new ideas and experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, for uh, an incredibly informative and, and, if I may say so, very moving um, presentation. And I think I think I, I hope I speak for everyone here when I say that um, I think we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude to to public library staff, um, public library staff around the country for all that they've done in their in their day jobs, beyond their day jobs, and 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 when um, seconded into other roles as well. Uh, I think it's been absolutely incredible. So thank you very much for that, and I look forward to to you rejoining us for the Q and A. Uh, at the end. So, so um, if we move on to our, our second presentation today, um, this is the No Barriers Approach, Making the Inclusive Archive a Reality. And that's from James Ranahan and Joanna Terry from Archives West Midlands. And Archives West Midlands supports members within the region. Uh, it builds relationships with key stakeholders and ensures that archive services have confidence and a robust framework. Uh, sorry, my video uh, turned off for no reason there. Uh, a robust framework to tackle professional priorities. Uh, James and Joanna will talk to us today about the No Barriers approach, making inclusive archives a reality. I'll hand over to them now. Okay, so good, good morning, everyone. I'm Joanna Terry. I'm Head of Archives and Heritage at Stafford County Council, and I'm also one of Archive West Midlands trustees. I'm here with Jim Ranahan, who's a cataloguing archivist, at Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and who is also a trustee and our secretary for Archives West Midland. And we're going to talk to you about our project called No Barriers and how we are supporting archive services to become more inclusive.
sorry, I was having trouble making the slide move. Um, so just a bit about Archives West Midlands. We're a charitable incorporated organisation which launched five years ago in 2016. I can't believe it, is, it was actually this month and I cannot believe how time has flown. We have 16 subscribed members from across the West Midlands. And these include local authorities, universities, charities, cathedrals, business archives and specialist collections. And what AWM is about is working together and forging a collective identity and providing a coherent and confident voice for the region's archives. We were supported by the National Archives to establish our organisation and we've also been fortunate enough to receive additional funding from them to deliver regional projects. And we feel that in times of financial constraint and, um, and also particularly during the last year of the pandemic, the collaboration is more important than ever. The sharing our knowledge and expertise makes us collectively stronger and creates new opportunities for exciting joint projects. One strand of work that we identified as a priority in, um, in the last, well, more than a year ago now, is around diversity and inclusion. We're all aware of the need to undertake this work and some of the challenges that face services about taking the right approach to this area. So we developed the No Barriers project to address this, uh, and that's what we're going to talk to you about this morning. So just talking a bit about how we do, uh, how our collaborative approach works and how Archives West Midlands works. So our approach really is that we support members and tackle some of the challenges that we face in the sector. An example is our, our first priority, which was around digital preservation. This was our cl clear early first priority as an organisation which members raised with us that they were struggling to progress this through lack of confidence, skills or knowing where to start. And so what we did was a, a sort of readiness assessment, which we, we did through a survey and we found out what, what the difficulties were. And then on the back of that, we delivered two funded projects. And through these projects, we developed model policies and procedures that would assist our members, which we shared on our website. And then we followed this with a series of training sessions. And what we were able to do was bring in the Digital Preservation Coalition, bring them in to deliver training in our region at an affordable rate for members. Um, and it was really important to be able to get together in Birmingham um, to experience the training. We continue to support our members with training on this area and we have a regular check in at our member meetings, which is to track progress on digital preservation. And members have welcomed this incremental approach and the ability to learn together as a cohort and to share their experiences with other services. So way back in 2019, 2020, we were looking at our, our year ahead. It was towards the end of 2019. And we identified another challenging priority for members, which was how to diversify our workforce, to be more representative of the communities that we cover. We had, as trustees, a really lengthy discussion. I can remember it. In fact, I think we had more than one discussion about how, how to do, do this and what was the right, right approach to take. And I think in a quite a brave decision, we committed some of our own money. Um, we are a, a member subscription organisation. So we commit, committed some of our own funds on an issue that really people can shy away from, as it can be perceived quite challenging to get it right. At the time, the National Archives Network funding stream was available. And this was we thought, well, an ideal opportunity for us to develop a project to recruit a trainee from a diverse background who could be supported by our services and develop the outline for a project which we would then deliver with further funding. And then we would continue to mentor the trainee um, by people from our member services. In developing our application, we appealed to our members to apply to be host service. We were initially looking for one host service, but we had a really good response. Uh, and so based on the experience of services, we selected Shakespeare Birthplace Trust as our main host, and then Wolverhampton Archives and Local Studies will be, an, a, within the 12 months, an additional mini placement. So just as we heard, that our application had been successful in March 2020. As you're all aware, the country went into the first national lockdown. All services were suspended. Um, and for Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, many of their staff were actually on furlough. So it did delay um, us 
rolling out the project. But what we did during 2020 was we took some time to have really good discussion with the National Archives, um, including Lucy Davis and Rachel Minot, to take their advice and confirm who we were targeting placements at, which is actually A-level or undergraduate, and to really take advice on how to deliver an inclusive recruitment process. We also developed job description and person specification and the adverts. And then once services were recovering, we discussed um, the project with the HR team at Shakespeare Birthplace Trust to ensure that our recruitment process would be inclusive and appropriate for the candidates, a supportive process, and that we would widely advertise it to reach our target market. We also developed a host agreement, which we have in place between Archives West Midlands and Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, which has clear ac accountabilities for the respective elements of the project. It's already been a learning uh, experience for us and our host services. And what I'm going to do now is hand you over to Jim, and he's going to talk about, to you about the progress of the project. Thank you, Joanna, and hello to everyone. So, um, of course, I'm a bit of a fraud today because I should be here reporting back on the success of the 12 month project. Whereas, as Joanna explained with the delay through the COVID um, situation. Um, we're just at the point where we're recruiting um, a trainee placement and we're just about to launch the project. So please bear with me as I tell you um, what we will be doing and I hope to get invited back next year to report on progress. So, the key elements that we're focusing on um, to try to reduce exclusion and increase diversity within the, the archive sector um, is to look at the workforce and also the user base. Um, so uh, you'll be aware from previous presentations at earlier DCDC that the archive sector is um, recognised as being 90% white um, within a, a, a multicultural, diverse community and society. So we need to look at ways to um, increase the representation of our workforce for its own sake, and also to present um, an inclusive face back out to the diverse communities that we're, we're intending to serve. So um, the placement, which is a 12 month placement, but part of a commitment by Archive West Midlands to long term development to, to make sure that uh, diversity, and in, uh, diversity and inclusion practices and procedures are really, really embedded within the sector. This placement um, is really focused on working out in partnership with communities what the barriers to um, those communities seeking careers within the archive sector and using and engaging with archive services to identify those barriers. So the first step was to look at um, how we could increase, uh, how we could bring in um, routes into the profession for people that wouldn't otherwise think automatically about archives as a career. Um, and the title of this slide, um, the from the recruitment pipeline through to the career pathway, is really about us thinking about the push-pull factors, what attracts or dissuades people from entering the um, archive sector and what can be done to increase our attractiveness. Um, the slide on screen is courtesy of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. It shows Willard White as Othello in the 1989 production in Stratford and Emma McKellen as Iago. Um, I've included it just because in 1989, it was seen, it was deemed 
completely appropriate to have a black actor playing a black character rather than a white actor blacked up, which had been the, tr the previous uh, practice. Um, but in 2021, we would really want to be asking Willard White whether he wanted to be cast as Othello or if he would prefer to be cast as Iago. So, and I have to say, I'm not speaking on Willard's behalf uh, at, at any point in, in this, but it's just to flag up that there are different ways of looking at processes um, which we we see, we feel comfortable with, and which we need sometimes to have um, an alternative perspective given to us. So, the case study that we've chosen, we've taken, we've chosen to take the recruitment process for No Barriers as a case study. Um, we needed the employer to be supportive. And thankfully, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust has embraced what we're doing because we're asking the employer to embark on a recruitment process um, to look at how we can widen the recruitment pipeline that we normally use. Um, you'll be aware that um, there's the 90% white presence within the archive workforce that I mentioned earlier. Um, we've worked really hard with our employers um, to, to get to a point where we, we've had uh, 58 applicants, um, 35 of whom were classed as white UK, um, and 21 of which were classed as um, non-white UK, um, two of which preferred not to say. Now that gives us um, a, a strike rate, if you like, of 60% recruitment and uh, from the white uh, UK population, 36% um, from a non-white or non-white UK. Um, now, that translated into a short list of um, five white UK, three non-white UK, um, and that, that really is for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust looking at its recruitment profile, and we are looking more closely at um, the, the profile for other members within Archives West Midlands. That is an improvement on our success rate, and we want to drill down to understand what the, 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 the reasons for that are. What our research has shown is that where we were targeting to recruit from a level or equivalent, we were less successful and we continued to attract um, um, three quarters of the total applications from first degree or higher. Um, so we attracted 14 A level or equivalent and 44 first degree or higher. Now that um, was. Um, interesting in its own right and it's it's um, given us access to um, very um, interesting and mixed and uh, well placed um, pool of people to recruit from but um, it does throw up the fact that our recruitment pipeline despite our earlier targeting um, um, as a positive action activity is still embedded in the in the traditional um, recruitment pool and that's a lesson for us to take forward. We have learned I think from this activity that we need to be even stronger than we were on 
product placement to place the um, our recruitment adverts within a wide range of of uh, locations and to to use a wide range of different uh, networks to promote the um, opportunity. We need to widen that pool of talent that we're uh, we're drawing from, and we need to really draw out the strengths of career pathways that can be supported by initiatives such as this placement. Thank you. And Joanna, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And this image is from the Deutsch um, photographic collection at the Library of Birmingham. And this is where we need to be focusing now. We've got the um, trainee placement, um, and we're going to be uh, working with the different um, uh, the, the, through the different hosts to link with different um, um, communities and to seek out collections that can um, be used as activities to um, to, to, to really build uh, respect and confidence in the archive services as we're going forward. We mentioned um, that we will be looking at research and we'll be providing a feedback loop um, for services and communities based on the experience that the trainee placement has in, in engaging with communities. Archives West Midlands will be providing ongoing mentoring to the trainee placement to ensure that um, the, um, the career pathway uh, idea is supported and is supported beyond the period of the 12 months. And drawing on the experience of Digital Preservation Coalition and their tremendous rapid assessment model, we are looking to have, um, and we've been inspired by that rapid assessment model, and we want to develop our own and use that as the basis to move forward um, in building confidence within our member services um, in terms of engaging with the issues around exclusion and, and tackling um, in, in inequality within, within society, but through our, our collections. Thank you, Joanna. The next slide, please. And then finally, we want to be drawing together our work on the recruitment, our understanding of the workplace, together with our um, our work with the community aspects of the collections, so that we can move together towards an inclusive archive. Um, it's an evolving process. It won't be just 12 months. Um, we will be learning from this and we will be moving forward. Um, the rapid assessment model will be developed and it will be promoted and it will be communicated with um, colleagues through training sessions, the first of which has already happened. Um, uh, it was um, in May of this year and this focused on um, spreading existing examples of good practice um, and we heard from Professor Corinne Fowler of the University of Leicester on the Colonial Countryside Project. And the, the application of that project approach to work in archives um, um, and just to take the big example of landed estate papers that are so common in um, archive services. Um, the rapid assessment model will be, the foundations of it will be laid over the next 12 months and it will be refined in the coming years. And we will, will be sharing that model um, with colleagues uh, through our own events and hopefully in partnership with the CDC in years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Jim and to Joanna for that. And um, 
if I may, I, uh, I think we're going to move straight on. Uh, I'm to, we'll pick up some really interesting issues from that, I'm sure, during the Q&A at the end. If we can move straight on uh, to the next presentation, the third presentation today. And we have uh, Joanna Green and Bob McLean from the University of Glasgow. Uh, sorry, my camera keeps turning off, so I apologise if you can't see me. Um, so Joanna is a lecturer in information studies at Glasgow and co-director of the Glasgow Wide Digital Cultural Heritage Arts Lab. And she has particular interests in how public audiences access written heritage and how emerging digital tools might allow for a more immersive sensory and a digital hands-on experience um, that has traditionally been possible. And in 2020, Joanna was one of a core group of staff who worked to develop best practice in remote object-based learning and teaching. Uh, with the university's archives and special collections um, uh, with using their virtual collections classroom technology. Um, and that was installed to assist with, uh, with the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, th and then Bob is rare book librarian in University of Glasgow archives and special collections and a member of the engagement team there uh, and leads on teaching and learning and engagement. So I'll hand over to Joanna and Bob now for their, for their uh, paper, which is item handling in lockdown, presenting the virtual collections classroom. Great, thank you. Okay, so a fundamental role of University in Glasgow archives and special collections and a core part of our business and service model is the use of our collections in teaching and learning. Just advance the slide here, sorry, there we go. In normal times, each academic year would see over 150 hours of object-based teaching delivered to up to 100 classes and 1,500 students. Now, the pandemic and its implications for in-person teaching obviously jeopardise this. So come May of 2020, we began to research and plan out possible technological solutions to permit continued support for collections teaching remotely via video conference. We used informal and formal contacts to begin to research suitable cameras and technologies while simultaneously building a business case for investment by consulting our regular academic collaborators to demonstrate demand. Now, the, the informal and informal contacts, what I mean by that is we, we, did, we, we reached out on social media, we sent emails to people who use the technology, and the formal contacts were largely uh, through our own IT department at the university. And here, just a, a, a quick shout out to one of our key collaborators, Joe Tinkler, who is the university's learning space technology specialist in the IT department. Now, when we actually explained the problem that we had to Joe and described our future needs and ideas, he explored lots of different options, came back with recommendations, articulated the, the pros and cons of different technologies to us, and then in complete partnership with us, designed a costed specification for refitting our teaching seminar room to deliver remote collections teaching access. So we've been really incredibly lucky to have Joe. Now, a key feature of the new audiovisual refit of our teaching space is a powerful ceiling mounted document camera, a Wolf Vision I-14, which can focus in on large objects, so as wide as two metres, or tiny objects just a few centimetres across. The over the shoulder perspective, which you're seeing here, allows the viewer from the comfort and safety of their bedroom, living room or kitchen to vicariously experience that same view as the person turning the pages. Camera straightforwardly works with Zoom, Teams or Echo 360 to allow live streamed or pre-recorded object handling. So it fitted neatly into the online teaching and learning model being offered by the University of Glasgow during the 2020-21 session. We've named the new uh, ceiling camera teaching service the Virtual Collections Classroom. The parameters and protocols of the service took a good while to establish with plenty of head scratching, discussion and input from all parts of the team. Now, using this camera tech to deliver online teaching, we quickly realised was quite, quite different from traditional in-person class visits. And so the rules and delivery, delivery rather had to change to reflect this. Our traditional in-person classes might see 12 to 15 students in the seminar room viewing and handling up to maybe 10 different items. So that's early printed books, manuscripts, photo albums, that type of thing. 
pre-class assessments would usually be, take place where members of the engagement team, the team in which I am a part of, supported by our conservation and preservation colleagues, would identify vulnerabilities in different items and then bespoke handling advice read for each of the items. <clears throat> that would mean some might be deemed completely safe for students to handle and look through carefully. Some might be safe for use, provided certain parts of the book are avoided. Now others then uh, again would be strictly look but don't touch. And then customarily a member of ASK staff, that's Archives and Special Collections staff, would be present throughout the class to help invigilate the session, offer information and advice and ensure collection safety. So in coming up with a new model, any new online only teaching model using this overhead camera, we realised would imply entirely different levels of risk. Now that is person to person risk and person to object risk, uh, and also different implications for support. Now, for example, for one thing, with no students in the room handling the objects, the implied collection risk we decided was lower. Provided the academic leading the session was competent and safe at handling and properly advised of specific object vulnerabilities, there was in fact no reason for an ASK member of staff to be present in the room during the class. Indeed, given the ongoing pandemic, mandating a member of staff to be present in the room during the session would arguably increase risk. That would be that person to person risk uh, to the participants. Therefore, the new service, Virtual Collections Classroom, is academic led with no ASK staff present in the room. Moreover, experimenting with the technology quickly led us to realise that sharing books and objects with the camera took quite a lot of time. That is time to safely set the object up, time to zoom in and focus, time to discuss uh, the, uh, the issues that you're uh, wishing to discuss, time to zoom back out, time to turn the pages and so on and so forth. So selecting, as we would normally, 10 objects for an hour or 90 minute long class was just not really realistic. We therefore chose to limit each class to a maximum of three items and encouraged instead a different approach from practitioners, a deeper engagement maybe with each item rather than a survey approach. Now, these are just two of the ways in which the tech and the delivery method informed our service design and offer. Delivering the service throughout the pandemic has been a big challenge for us, given the constant changes of public health level and the number of staff on site at any one time. So key has been designing a workflow model that explicitly outlines what needs done when and by whom, making sure sufficient time is inbuilt to allow for things to go a bit wrong. Uh, and while this uh, VCC, our Virtual Collections Classroom workflow, centres on the task completed by the ASK engagement team, the team in which I'm a part of, all ASK colleagues, in fact, contribute in some way from our metadata colleagues maintaining and updating the catalogue records to ensure findability right the way through to our conservation and preservation colleagues who, are, who, who did things like offer assessment advice to, the, to my team uh, through uh, Zoom and desktop visualizers, given that we were all distributed in different places. The immediate future is problem solving again. The new academic session will, we hope, see a return to in-person small group teaching, yet the physical distancing requirements will likely imply that our collections uh, teaching classes will have to be hybrid or, or blended sessions uh, in some way rather than uh, just in-person only. So we've been busy considering what further tech investments uh, might be required to support that form of teaching uh, and what changes to our protocols and procedures might be required to deliver that form of teaching safely and sustainably. In the longer term, we're considering the range of additional services that we might offer based on this new technology. Uh, from a teaching point of view, which is what I'm mostly interested in, the, the most exciting, I think, is that, well, once students are able to return to lecture theatres, certainly, is the thought that we can share handling sessions to you know, upwards of 500 first year undergraduates at any one time, something that's simply been unthinkable in the past for large class sizes. So that form of encounter, you know, primary source encounter for students at such an early stage in their academic journey might even have long lasting implications for the development of research skills and, and other skills like that. So thank you. That's the end of my bit. I'm going to now hand over to Joanna to keep going. So Joanna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you so much, Bob. Hello, everybody. Um, to follow on from what Bob's just said, I'm now going to provide a user case study perspective as one of the aforementioned academics who use this technology in their teaching during the past academic year. To provide some context, um, I'm a lecturer based within information studies at the University of Glasgow. Bob, could you click the next slide for me, please? Where all of our taught programmes using archives and special collections in their teaching um, and where all are professionally accredited, firstly by SILIP across the board, and secondly by ARA in the case of our professional MSc in information management and preservation. This presented us early on in the pandemic with a number of challenges. One, how we might continue collections access for subject teaching and student research. And two, how we might be able to provide item handling training, given our students would be without physical access to our collections during the academic year. To give an idea of scale, in a typical year, our MSc information management students would receive an hour's item handling experience every single week for 12 weeks across one of their core courses. This combined with their professional accreditation meant that this access couldn't easily be removed without having a profound effect on the nature of what and how we teach our subject and the development of those core professional skills our accreditation requires of us. The adoption of the Wolf Vision camera came as an enormous relief, but it also provided a brilliant opportunity to further develop the ways in which we enable collections access and support meaningful and engaging learning and teaching within our discipline. So given that context, let me focus a little further on a central problem for delivering my core co course to our information management uh, students, a course called Records and Evidence, which in 2020-2021 had nearly 50, that's five zero, students enrolled. Given our investment in this Wolf Vision technology, a key consideration for me as an academic was not just that I now had virtual access, brilliant as that was, but how exactly I could use the technology in a meaningful way to support student engagement, autonomous learning and active student participation. A big motivation for me is how we communicate the materiality of our collections digitally. And this came to the fore during this last academic year. I very much lean in to the sensory engagement we all have when we physically encounter and handle material objects in our collections. It's a brilliantly easy way for me to spark engagement from my students in the materials we encounter. But when this experience is removed and at a distance, I was faced with that challenge of active engagement. Great as the technology is, which you can see here on screen, I could very easily simply just use it to deliver a lecture style class where I'm the one talking through the items on display and the students are simply watching and listening over Zoom. And I really didn't want to do that. Though that delivery absolutely has its place in our teaching, in terms of teaching item handling, it's not particularly inspiring and it certainly doesn't promote active learning, curiosity and skills development which to me are crucial for students training to be accredited professionals. As you might be able to see from the comments on screen here, early use of the camera revealed that, that the technology was a huge hit with students in terms of the visual access it provided, with students commenting that they'd never seen papyrus so close up before, how exploring the item digitally was much better in terms of equity of visual access than physical handling might provide. In other words, we could see more detail using the digital zoom than our human eye might in person with that object. And finally, how this material detail allowed them to consider more closely why the material object that our records exist on in our collections hold evidential value, a key concern for the course. While this was extremely pleasing to hear, it didn't solve the issue of delivering handling training in a student-centered way. In short, I wanted to deliver item handling in a way that put them in control of what we saw, how we handled items and what we explored, that upheld our professional skills training and accreditation, that spoke to the handling needs of individual objects in a way that embraced the materiality of that object, and finally, that prioritised the conservation and handling requirements of each item. I wanted a solution that retained as much of that individual student autonomy of a face-to-face -face handling class, but in a digital and remote learning environment without risking our collections. In thinking out how I deliver these classes, 
I remembered those choose your own ending books that I used to read as a child. In them, you get to a certain point in the story and you're then presented with a series of options for where you want the story to go. Having chosen your path, you then turn to the relevant page and you read on. And it put you as a reader at the center of that encounter with that story. And that's the approach I adopted with my handling classes. Using a series of pre-designed Zoom polls, an example of which you can see on screen here, I was able to put the students in charge of the experience. By using the polls as a voting system, they chose which items they saw first, they decided which supports and weights we might use for handling each item, they directed which aspects of that item we explored and in what order. In essence, what they voted for, I did. With me based physically in our virtual collection classroom, handling the items live over Zoom, my colleagues Nicole Smith and Michelle Craig released the polls on Zoom for me. They engaged with students' reactions, questions and responses using Zoom's chat function and then fed them back to me verbally. This enabled me to concentrate on handling, prioritising the conservation needs of the item, while allowing the students to feel in charge of the experience and to learn not just by watching, but by doing. If students voted for a handling method I felt was inappropriate for an item, we talked through why that was and why another approach would be preferable, and then I would demonstrate. This helped students to learn to respond to the individual needs of each item we encountered and to trust their own growing professional intuition in regards to quote unquote, correct handling practice. At the end of each class, I followed up this live experience with access to 2D images both professionally digitized images organized by the library and those taken by me on a smartphone, as well as pre-recorded handling videos and the recordings of the live handling classes so that students could revisit items and explore them again digitally on their own terms and in their own time. The students' feedback was overwhelmingly positive. They commented on the benefits of not having to physically crowd around each item as we might have had to do in person. They felt that they were in control of what we did in class even though it was at a physical distance. In a year when most students across the UK went without physical hands-on access to collections, we were able to create meaningful digital engagement with our collections and use the technology we'd invested in in new and exciting ways. We turned what might have been a passive experience into an active journey, journey of discovery personalised to the students' interests. Rather than me prioritising what I wanted to deliver, I prioritised what the students wanted to explore, which led to more meaningful engagement evidenced in their assessment performance, as well as their feedback. Perhaps the most rewarding of all, the students nominated me in our university's annual teaching awards. And I'm very pleased to say this led to my being awarded best practice in online learning for this teaching innovation, which has to be a career highlight. So what are the issues going forward for us into a new academic year, once again, filled with uncertainty? For me, it's how we learn from and adapt these approaches for future groups of students, larger groups of students, external users, and how we begin to use this technology, not just to deliver remote access, but to enhance face-to-face -face classes as well. I hope what we've shown today is that while we might have missed out on collections handling in person this year, digital access can be equally meaningful, engaging and empowering when we place the user's needs at the center. It's simply a case of working together with our colleagues in archives and special collections and our student users to co-create new methods of engagement with these technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna and Bob, for, for that. Right, so I think we want to get some questions in. That was a great presentation, but we want to get on to the questions. And so if I can ask the other um, panellists to just pop their uh, cameras on if they can and we will um, we will get going so um, I'm going I'm going to come to you first uh, Isabel and um, I, before before I ask the question I just want to acknowledge a couple of, um, of, of of questions that are perhaps more like comments so one from George Dukes and also from Maria Gayton uh, Maria talking about the experience in Dorset um, and, and really talking about the importance of human contact um, and the role that the that, that public library services have had um, as more than just places to get books, but really about that human contact and acknowledging that and acknowledging that that's happening and that li public libraries have tightened their connections with 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 people. Um, 
So, uh, I, I, but the question, I, I'm going to take the, the one from Catherine Short um, uh, at DMU, who says, regarding the keeping in touch calls, what emotional support is being given to library staff who've been, who've been making those calls, such as bereavement counselling, et, et, et cetera? I mean, that's what they sound like. They sound like bereavement counselling in many cases. And, and I'd add to that, do you think there's a long term kind of impact on morale within, uh, within public library staff? Yeah, this is a really, really important question. Um, and the answer is, I think the support varies because, of course, libraries are run as um, separate services. Um, so in England, there's 150 separate library services. Most of them still um, embedded as part of a local authority. Some of them run um, as, as spin out separately. So the support available does vary. Um, but I think that the task of bringing teams back together, rebuilding morale, supporting each individual, um, that's a, that is a daunting one that's facing heads of service. And I'm so sorry, you might be getting some background noise because my washing machine has chosen to go and spin at this very moment. <laughs> sorry, I could see you looking a bit puzzled. Um, so we ran, um, we ran a heads of service webinar about this um, recently. Um, and we had a really, really powerful presentation from somebody from Batley Library. So Batley Library had um, a horrendous experience a while ago when the MP Joe Cox was murdered just outside the library. Um, and um, she usually held her surgery in the library, so she was known to library staff. The, the chap who committed this terrible deed was um, did use the library at times. It was very, you know, the impact on library staff was enormous. And what we learned from that presentation was how different people react at different times. Um, how for some individuals there may be no visible sign, but there's an awful lot of uh, mental and emotional trauma underneath that may come out at different times. So I think on reflecting on the pandemic, we're aware that every individual's experience has been different. Library staff were redeployed to all sorts of different jobs. Some of them continued doing um, familiar library work. Others, some library staff were sent home with no IT, weren't really able to do anything. Um, so the experience for them was potentially frustrating, boring, but difficult. Um, and of course, everyone had different experiences in their personal and family lives. So I think, in, in, you know, it's, it's an enormous task to bring people back together, to get them focused positively on the future, to deal with people's exhaustion, emotional exhaustion um, and physical exhaustion and, and to forge a, a, a clear path forward in what's still very uncertain times. Um, so for services where they're lucky enough to have good emotional and mental health support within their authority, I know they've been sort of drawing on that. But I think there's, you know, it, it's not going to be a quick fix. I think it's something that supporting library staff um, to return to the library. They won't be returning to how jobs were before either. Things, things will continue to be different. So I think that's going to be one of the main challenges facing uh, those leading and managing libraries over the next six months, over the next year, over the next two years and longer, absolutely. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, uh, a wonderful answer to that, and um, uh, and yeah, I, I agree. It's it's a it's a, a varied pattern, and I don't think there's, there's a one size fits all problem, and it's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, solution. So, so I want to move on and, and ask a question which has come from Mary McKenzie and that's to, um, to Jim and Joanna um, and, and, they're asked, and, and Mary's asking what is the most important advice that you would give to other organisations wanting to develop a similar project to No Barriers? I don't know which of you wants to take that. <laughs> um, shall I start and um, Jim can follow up if I've missed anything. Um, I think I mentioned at the beginning that we had a long discussion about it and, and we sort of talked around the pros and cons and the um, and in some instances the services talked about you know difficulties that they faced in the past. I think having a having a really long having a long discussion was quite useful in highlighting what the issues would be. Um, but then I think we we were able to sort of come to an agreement about about the vision um, that we wanted for the project and that early commitment see it through the end so we, we talked about a lot of projects where the theme work happened and then it had stopped and, and nothing had followed through so it was about um us really committing as an organization to support the trainee who who will be working with us um and i think that's really important to think about your plans in, the, in that longer term uh, who wants to add anything else uh, thank you joanna the, the only thing i add is that um, 
in hindsight, we probably fell into the trap collectively of being a little bit too timid about the um, the nature of the subject that we're trying to tackle. Um, so intellectually, we all understand the um, the landscape, the political and social landscape in which we, we're um, engaging. But um, we, um, we, my personal view is that we um, fell into the trap of being timid archivists. And whilst we were brave for ourselves, in hindsight, I would, um, urge us to be braver in, 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 in moving forward. And an example of this would be the language um, you, to be used around um, positive action engagement, positive action traineeships, um, so that um, we, we are engaging in um, um, so, um, sometimes controversial, sometimes sensitive areas. We, we, we did use um, officially sanctioned language that is legally correct and legally appropriate. Um, but um, there is another range of vocabulary to go alongside that that is also legally correct and legally appropriate. So um, that's, that's what I would be feeding into mm -hmm. the findings of the case study that we're developing around the whole recruitment and selection process. Thank you both. So, so having having a vision and then and then really being bold about it, overcoming perhaps the natural timidity of the archivist. Although I'm, never, I'm sure we're rarely accused of that. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you. That's fantastic. I've, I've got a couple of questions that have come through for um, for Joanna and and Bob on the on the Glasgow presentation. So, uh, Caroline um, Caroline Sampson, thank you for taking the words out of my mouth on this one. Um, uh, asking how you assess the competence of academic staff to handle documents uh, without, without Bob's and nodding already, uh, without the presence of your staff. And have you found academics and senior managers resist this or and would prefer to, to rely on their credentials and reputation rather than something like a skills audit? Good question. When, when you put it like that, it sounds quite sensitive. <laughs> um, to be quite honest, the, I mean, the first thing to say is that the vast majority of academics, I have to say this with Joanna on the call, handle very, very well. You know, they're, they're usually experienced researchers and it's not really a, a, a problem at all. Uh, the other thing, I suppose, then is to say that the, the approach that we've taken is very much a team approach. So everything that we were doing, it was not just the engagement team, it was our conservation and preservation colleagues. So by going through and actually taking, uh, leading from the items and working out what the vulnerabilities are uh, and what the, the potential risks are, you can immediately work out what sort of handling reminders or advice needs to get passed on. Uh, then when it actually came to delivering the sessions, uh, there would be that kind of uh, reminder to the academic. So there would usually be um, a, a chance for them to come in and mark up their books uh, with, with acid-free slips, that type of thing, before the session. And at that point, you could have that discussion about, okay, this one uh, has got uh, fr you know, fragile, friable paper at the back, it's got soft paper, historic mould damage, that kind of thing, and talk about each item. Uh, and by doing that, you can then talk about um, the best way of handling to actually uh, uh, um, limit and, and mitigate any damage. That way, you're not really having a discussion about, OK, show me how to handle this and I'm going to critique you. It, it becomes more of a kind of object led one. Uh, that said, in trying to kind of review this sort of process um, before the start of the new uh, semester, we are also considering uh, a kind of um, having a kind of mandatory kind of reminder session with everyone, anyone who books in, you know, ask them to come in and actually we just go through some of this stuff with them. Just because I think, uh, you know, no matter how experienced you are, and I include myself in this, um, if, if a conservator critiques my handling or, or looks at my handling, they'll see different things that I may be doing wrong, even though I've worked for 20 odd years with this material. So that's, that's the kind of approach we've taken so far, if that helps. I, oh, and on on um, pushback from that, no, we've had none actually, and uh, you know everyone's very. Uh, we've got good relationships with all of our academic colleagues. 
great that's uh, that that's really excellent to to hear and i just just one more for one more for glasgow before we i move on to to to, to others which is from neil stewart at lse i'm wondering if there are plans to offer services to researchers to allow this type of virtual access so an extension from the teaching environment into a sort of a more a wider research environment yeah completely uh, that's again i i, I you know, didn't really have time to touch on the longer term plans but yes we see the application for this for uh, for researchers as well for things like uh, you know comparing two similar items in different places that type of thing. So yes, this is something we will allow people to, to book in. Uh, we've also already used it uh, for things like uh, conference presentations, that type of thing, where people have used the tech to to actually live uh, live present an object rather than slides of an object. That kind of thing. so there are all sorts of longer term applications for this. Uh, that are non-teaching as well as as well as well so so yes hopefully great so so i want to move on to ask um, to ask you all actually the, uh, the same question but obviously you've all got different audiences so i'm you're, you're going to be in a very different uh, uh, context so so obviously the pandemic has um, has been an enormous challenge for 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 everybody but but um, necessity can be the mother of invention and i think we've seen uh, some really incredible examples of, of people rising to those to, to the the challenges so i wanted to ask each of you you know in terms of in terms of the of how we might overcome the challenges that our audiences face whether that's a access to collections challenge or an access to the work to, to getting into the workforce challenge or the kind of the huge kind of disadvantage gap that isabel spoke about um what are your hopes for the future and if i can go to 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 you uh, first and um, perhaps uh, jim and joanna um what what do you what what are your hopes for the future Um, I suppose I think I hope that the, the real growth of the digital access and online um, will perhaps bring in people from different different disciplines, different areas to, to approach archives um, that might not have ordinarily got involved. Um, and and I really hope that the you know I think we're all aware of that the online conversations that we have certainly particularly through last year that really started to challenge those preconceptions that that can continue and we can continue sort of pushing down those barriers to make um, our, our sector a much more attractive and viable career path for people regardless of their background but it, that it ceases to be you know that that sort of thing that gets in the way. Great thank you very much. Jim did you want to add anything? Uh, yes I, 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 support, I support Joanna on that and um, I suppose the silver lining um, for the No Barriers project um, is that we've been forced into making it an online presence only. So the um, the, the, the amount of on-site engagement um, for the trainee is going to be minimal. Um, that forces um, both the hosts and the trainee to to work. Um, online and to study what is currently available online and how is it presented and then through that hopefully to um, allow us all to um, to remove well reduce and hopefully uh, remove the, the, the barriers of um, bad description or <laughs> insensitive description and um, um, increase the, the, the range of online uh, resources um, and and so there is an opportunity a definite opportunity now thank thank you jim and, and then if i can say same question then to to joanna and bob um uh hopes for the future um i'll go first um i think from a teaching point of view one of my big hopes for the future is to think about how we deliver collections access to really large student groups, which Bob alluded to. It's always been something that we've been really keen to do, but managing those student numbers is obviously extremely difficult um, when you're handling individual items. And um, so the technology really opens up the ways in which we can develop those skills from first year onwards, which they, you know, in a Scottish degree system, four year degree system, they might not have got until third year and fourth year. And I think we'll see a huge impact on the level of their skills and their engagement with our collections and the research that comes out of that once we start to initiate that at level one. So that would be a big hope for me. Bob? Right. Um, I, 
I think I'm, I'm interested to see where this technology takes us, to be quite honest. I, it's important to actually be realistic and say that this is not um, as this is not going to supplant or replace traditional in-person encounters with books, whether it's teaching or research. Uh, however, it will it can offer something complementary, something different. Uh, we can learn things from 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 the different encounters. We can learn things uh, through uh, through using these 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 um, uh, digital technologies, this this visualizer technology that we couldn't necessarily. In, in person. So uh, we've already been thinking about uh, uh, some of the different possible uses for this in the longer term. But what I'm really excited about is just continuing to share this with academic colleagues uh, and with different uh, stakeholder groups and really seeing what ideas they've got uh, for this, a, a more user-centered approach for this and just see what other new services we can, we can design around this to, to help support our users. Great, thank you both for that. And then, and then, same question, Isabel. Um, obviously, an incredibly challenging year for public libraries, but some grounds for hope. Yeah, absolutely. Because as I say, I think you know, libraries have really proved their worth. But one thing that I'd really, really like to see is um, that, that trust in staff, letting them experiment and innovate. Um, you know, so a lot of the red tape was thrown away in the early lockdown. I mean, a lot of it's come back with a vengeance. But I think that's why we saw innovations and you know and listening to the other presentations today the innovation and change is driven by the staff because they are the people who work with library users every day know their communities know their needs you know that's really really where you can get great innovation coming from so i really hope that um in in all types of libraries we, we can continue to empower staff to make those changes to come up with great ideas and and to think of um, experiment rather than controlling risk. You know, let, let's experiment. We'll get some things wrong. But every time we get something wrong, we learn something and hopefully we'll, you know, get some great new, great new stuff happening. 